a very good evening to you. Welcome along once again to Sweet and Swing here on Max Radio. Howard Kane in the chair until the top of the hour with some of those sounds from long ago and far away. What have we got? More from our Gracie. Always enjoy a bit of Gracie Fields. Artie Shaw, the perfectionist, not heard from him for a while. George Shearing, never go wrong. The music of Ivan Novello. But to start off... We blow away those winter blues with some Cuban sunshine. Edmundo Ross and Manana. The fence is falling down My pocket needs some money So I can't go into town My brother isn't working And my sister doesn't care The car she needs a motor So I can't go anywhere Manana 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 is soon enough for me Manana 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 is soon enough for me the window she is broken and the rain is coming in If someone doesn't fix it I'll be soaking to my skin But if we wait a day or two the rain may go away And we don't need a window on such a sunny day Manana, manana, manana is soon enough for me Manana, manana, manana my mother's always working she is working very hard but every time she looks for me i'm sleeping in the yard my mother thinks i'm lazy and maybe she is right I'll go to work manana But I've got to sleep tonight Manana 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 is soon enough for me Manana 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 is soon enough for me My brother took his suitcase And he went away to school My father said he'd only learn To be a silly fool my father said that I should learn to make a chili pot But then I burned the house down, the chili was too hot Manana, manana, manana is soon enough for me Manana, manana, manana is soon enough for me What a way to get going. A bit of sunshine. And did, did I say manana? Ma Dear me, my linguistic skills aren't what they used to be. Manana. Not manana or banana. Manana. We'll get there yet. Manana. Of course it is. Uh, just, well, yes, I'm not going to dwell on that. Just sheer stupidity on my behalf. There we go. Edmundo Ross. And uh, I was going to say he lived to a good old age. Not difficult to tell because this is taken from the Edmundo Ross Centenary Tribute Album. Would you believe? Yes, he lived to a ripe old age, 101 
I think, a unique character in the British dance band world in many ways. Born in Port of Spain in Trinidad in December of 1910 and was going to go into the legal profession. There wasn't a lot of money around, so instead he volunteered for the army. That's something of a change. Played in the military band there, became a timpanist in the Venezuelan State Symphony Orchestra and then he got a scholarship in 1937 to the Royal Academy of Music in London. And he stayed then in Britain for years until he retired back to Spain right at the end of his life. Started playing with Dan Marino Barreto and then formed his own band in 1940. Victor Sylvester, now he's a name we quite often conjure with here on Sweet and Swing, suggested to Edmundo that the British audience needed something a little bit less rigid than the real, true Latin American styles which were very much in vogue at the time. And Edmundo took this on board, well you would, wouldn't you, from Victor Sylvester, and uh, with that great enthusiasm and that looser style, he became really popular with all sorts of people, starting out in a small London nightclub which doubled as an air raid shelter. Wow, that's a happy mix, isn't it? Where people arrived in very large numbers to, well, avoid the bombing overhead, as it were, but they rather liked the music as well, and so more and more people came as it spread on the grapevine. And he ended up then um, at the Coconut Grove in Regent Street, which Edmundo bought a year or two later, and renamed the Edmundo Ross Dinner and Supper Club. You would, wouldn't you? He recorded continuously from 1941, I should say, for around 34 years and had lots of hits. Cuban Love Song, of course, The Wedding Samba, a hit record in 1949. A great character, and I think it was the fact that he was different and colourful. The music's colourful, it's bright, it's cheerful. It was just the right person doing the right music at the right time. I think that was the key to his success, a colourful character. Austerity, of course, wartime austerity, so anyone who dressed flamboyantly as he did with colourful music and musicians were going to stand out. And also very different to the traditional British dance orchestra with those new sort of sounds introducing steps which hadn't been seen before. Rumbas and sambas and cha-cha-chas and all those different types of music. It was, well, it was just different, wasn't it? A very different sort of thing. At the end, not quite so good, in 1966, when he was still playing, very much at the height of his fame, he was involved in a serious car accident, and that led then to arthritis and quite a lot of pain before he eventually retired. And uh, just looking at the notes written by Edmund Whitehouse on this collection, uh, and he remarks that the end came swiftly, however, because on his seventh tour of Japan in 1975, seventh tour of Japan, doesn't bear thinking about it, does it? Amazing. He discovered the band's shop steward was doing deals with venues behind his back and generally undermining his authority. Taking advantage of what was then a relatively elderly man, I thought. After returning to England, he therefore arranged a celebratory dinner, surprisingly announcing the disbanding of the orchestra, destroyed most of the band arrangements and just walked away and went out to Alicante to live out the rest of his years. Well, the shop steward got his just desserts, didn't he? Not really very fair at all after the work he'd done. He was made a Freeman of the City of London in 2000 at the age of 90 and awarded an OBE for services to music. Not a bad life. There's always some sort of tragedy and joy and sorrow, I suppose, in every life, isn't there? And a bit of tragedy and sparkling joy in Edmundo's life one way or another. But a long life and the vast bulk of it, very good. And I think he did get his karma at the end. <laughs> Our romance won't end on a sorrowful note Though by tomorrow you're gone The song is ended But as the songwriter wrote The melody lingers on Now they may take you from me I'll miss your fond caress But though they take you from me I'll still the way you wear your hat The way you sip your tea The memory of all that No, no, they can't take that away from me 
the way your smile just beams The way you sing off key The way you haunt my dreams No, no, they can't take that away from me Now we may never, never meet again On the bumpy road to love Still I'll always, always Keep the memory of The way you hold your knife The way we danced till three The way you've changed my life No, no, they can't take that away from me No, they can't take that away from me The car <laughs> when we were on a spree. No matter where you are, no, 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 they can't take that away from me. No, they can't take that away. Cause I know you're here to stay. They can't take that away from me. Recognize that voice? Well, I don't know that I would have done straight off or not. Very famous, of course. Top marks. Give yourself a pat on the back if you said Fred Astaire, because you're absolutely right. It was Fred Astaire. I would guess that it was at the end of his career rather than the beginning of his career, that one. I think that's a good educated guess, isn't it? And I think uh, just looking at the notes, which are tiny, can barely read the writing, actually, but uh, looks like it might have been around the 1970s, uh, that recording. So I think, yes, past perhaps his uh, heyday in many ways. And so he was a, a man of slightly more mature years by the time he recorded that one. But a good one, nonetheless. You can't get wrong with Fred Astaire. They can't take that away from me. Absolutely right. Fred Hartley and his quintet. How about some songs of Jerome Kern? See what you recognise there. Here or even there. Take your pick.
what a flourish to finish. How did you get on then? Did you get them all right? Not too difficult, I don't think. That one, Fred Hartley and his quintet back in the, uh, I think it was late 1920s, maybe early 1930s on that one with what well, I think you can happily say was a little, uh, a little medley, couldn't you, one way or another. Well, music put together in a way rather reminiscent of someone like uh, Charlie Kunz or someone along those lines. So what did he start off with? He started off with Dancing Time. Yeah, do you get that? Dancing Time. Dancing Time, followed by Do You Love Me? And then Why Do I Love You? Dee, 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 dee. You remember that one, don't you? And then, of course, we have Old Man River. I'm sure you recognise that one. Fred Hartley's Quintet, a sort of light music ensemble rather than a, a dance band per se, but very, very popular in the 1930s, uh, playing that selection of music from Jerome Kern there. Fred himself, who was born in Dundee, where they make the cakes, made his first broadcast as a pianist in 1924. Then in 1931, formed the Quintet, which made lots of broadcasts and recordings, and backed many of the stars who went on to record on Decker. And the leader of the Quintet at the time was one Reginald Leopold, yes, the famous violinist leading Fred Hartley's band there. Terrific stuff, enjoyed that. Time for some Gracie. We've been looking back at Gracie Fields and celebrating the, the wonderful voice and character and actress and woman that she was, I guess, uh, sort of an epitome of northern life in Britain around the pre- and post-war years, I would guess. Here she is, playing with fire.
pianist he was, not in the perhaps classic setting which we've featured oh, several times over the years, mostly because I really enjoyed the George Shearing quintet with the vibes and guitar, but he played in lots of other settings as well, of course, so we're celebrating one of those, whether a solo or duo, trio, whatever the case may be. This can't be love. With, yeah, a wonderful lineup, Louis Stewart on guitar, the brilliant Danish bass player Niels Henning Ørsted Pedersen on the bass, who died tragically young. He played, well, he played with George, he played with who's who. He was like the number one bass player, I think, certainly in Europe, if not the world at one stage. So nimble and and, uh, swinging all the time, of course, and died tragically young. I don't remember quite what of, but I know he was no age whatsoever and died very suddenly, as I recall. And, of course, perhaps best known to a lot of people, playing as he did for years with Oscar Peterson and the trio. But, yeah, sad loss to the jazz world there when uh, Niels died. 1979, that was recorded in Willingen. My sister used to live there briefly in West Germany. Before that, a bit closer to home, R. Gracie. Well, I don't know that well, actually. I mean, there are lots of people do know, as we say, Sally and, you know, Biggest Aspidistra, even the Manx Cat is vaguely known, but uh, I didn't know that one so well. I'm playing with fire. Quite nice. I rather like that one. We'll have another one. We'll have a more novelty one next week, shall we? What's the one about the nudist? Yeah. What can you give a nudist? They haven't got pockets or something. Something along those lines. Tis Sweet and Swing, H with you on a Friday evening here on Manx Radio. Always a pleasure. Don't forget, do drop me a line any time. That's been a bit quiet on the post and email front, so see if we can start the new year with a little bit more uh, a little bit more traffic. It'd be nice to hear from uh, people, perhaps. Or oh, a few more people, a few new people. Howard Kane at manxradio.com, C-A-I-N-E, is the easiest way. Oh, the fastest way, most certainly, because it's uh, straight through, email, there we are, bish bash bosh, as my colleague Mark would say, and it's done and there instantaneously. However, if you prefer the slightly more romantic snail mail, putting pen to paper, writing a card, a letter, battled and bond, whatever the case may be, Howard Kane, Sweet and Swing, Max Radio, Broadcasting House, Douglas Head, Douglas, in the Isle of Man, and the code I M one five. B W. I do think it's right to say that it's more romantic that way, isn't it? Isn't it romantic?
Told you it was romantic. Isn't that romantic? Jick James, Pearl Carr, singing there with uh, Cyril Stapleton and the band, if you're interested. Dick James, well, again, how many people remember him these days? I suspect the answer is not many. Uh, born, not Dick James, of course. How many of them were born with their real names? The number of these singers who did have stage names, it was just the thing at the time to have the right sort of name. He was Isaac Vapnik, was his real name. I quite like that, but whether it's, I don't know, would, would that work? Isaac Vapnik and his band, I don't know. Isaac Vapnik, um, and he sang, of course, with Cyril Stapleton, as we heard, the Skyrockets, Geraldo, and later went on to own his own, own music publishing company. And he didn't do too badly at that, as well as the singing, because he had uh, songs by, oh, I don't know, little-known people like The Beatles and Elton John. Yeah, did all right, didn't he? Found a member of the Stargazers group as well, and also performed for... Henry Hall. Pearl Carr went on to some stardom, didn't she? In 1944, she was singing with Phil's Green, Phil Green's band when she met her future hubby, the drummer vocalist Teddy Johnson. She married him 11 years later and they formed a rather famous singing partnership, of course. Most well-known song? Sing Little Birdie, I'd imagine. Came second in the 1959 Eurovision Song Contest. If you can cast your mind back that far. Now, I promised you a little bit of Artie Shaw. Haven't had Artie for a while, the old perfectionist who packed up at the peak of his fame because he wasn't too certain he could do things absolutely perfectly. Not perfectly. Get it right, H? I think everyone else thought he did, but he didn't. It's a long way to Tipperary. So they say. <laughs> Thank you. 
since you have given me my sweetest dream Dear, won't you make it true? Tell me the dream that's made life seem divine Is yours as well as mine Since you have given me a fair new world Say you'll share all that's there For this old world to me seem cold and gray Until you came my way And change the clouds to sunny skies And desert wastes to paradise But I should lose my heaven, sweetheart If ever we should part So since you give me my sweetest dream Make it mine at all times For I'll find in a lifetime spent with you My sweetest dream come true Twofers this evening? Why not? I always enjoyed the twofer. So um, that was Mrs. Jack Hilton, Ennis Parks, as she was known. And of course, rumour has it, I've never actually tried to conclusively prove it because there seemed to be a little bit debate about whether she was born on the Isle of Man. I've seen some people saying or some claims that she was born here and others that she was born in Blackpool. I'll have another look at some stage and rummage round. Take your pick. We'll say for the sake of argument, she was born on the Isle of Man. Either way, she was born Ennis Parks in around 1894, and between 1933 and 1937, she was uh, Mrs Jack Hilton. There, yeah, didn't run forever, of course. Ran her own band, uh, her ex-wife after that, but ran her own band under the label Mrs Jack Hilton, uh, and recorded for Crown, the sort of the sixpenny... Woolworth label and retired through ill health uh, fairly early on. Billy Turner, her husband's deputy, took over the reins of that band after she decided that she could no longer continue with it. Before that, Archie Shaw, the perfectionist, as we always call him, and I think he was quite well known for being that. And the clarinet, well, the clarinet, of course, very popular early doors. It had the distinct advantage over its rivals in the Reed family that it's Talbra was more efficiently captured by the early recording equipment that had real trouble doing justice to, say, the broader sort of sounds that you might get out of a saxophone. So it was very popular. That's one of the reasons it was so popular in the early parts of jazz and swing. You hear more clarinet than you would do sax because the recording equipment of the day was better at catching the sound of the clarinet realistically. Um, but even after the advance to all electric recordings, of course, and greater sophistication in studio technique, it still had something of a position by then in, in most jazz and dance bands, and it stayed that way right the way through the 1920s and 1930s. And Artie Shaw, in uh, his autobiography, The Trouble with Cinderella, be a good read, I imagine. I've never actually read it. Must take a look and see if the old uh, maestro still got it on his shelves before they all disappear. Uh, he only managed to secure a job with the band by claiming, he said, to be able to double on clarinet and sax. He was very competent on the saxophone, but actually had never played the clarinet before. <laughs> a little bit of bluffing going on there. Um, but he was uh, assumed, rather erroneously, the key structures for the two were similar. They ain't, uh, it has to be said. Fortunately... Such was his musical talent and his resourcefulness, he overcame the problem and also convinced him the clarinet was to be his instrument. And he was to take more convincing. He also had abilities as a band leader, however. But nonetheless, you couldn't doubt his playing ability. No doubt about that whatsoever. Ivor Novello. The music of Ivor Novello fits very nicely into our sweet and swing category, I would say. From Glamorous Night... When the gypsy played.
go. I think Morris could play that one on uh, a little light music on Thursday evening. If you like, he might have done already, for all I know. There's a bit of crossover going on there. Gypsy played the music of either novello, firmly fitting into the sweet category, I think, of sweet and swing. I'm just looking to see who's there. Patricia Johnson, John Stoddart, Patricia Bartlett, the Linden Singers and the New World Show Orchestra conducted by Kenneth Alwyn. I can tell you performed that. Well, that makes something a little bit different, doesn't it? We'll counteract the suite with some good old boogie-woogie. The world's greatest jazz band and alligator crawl. <laughs> Quite right, too. Free Trade Hall 1971. A fair amount of applause going on there for a wonderful version of Alligator, Alligator Crawl by the world's greatest jazz band, nonetheless. A wonderful band who, like I said, we did have the pleasure of seeing, at least the old maestro did, and they played and toured quite extensively for a number of years. They're in Manchester, like I said, in the early 1970s. And we've been uh, catching up with a little bit of the their chequered history <laughs> it makes for a interesting reading to say the very least we heard about how they'd had that start dodgy start 
with the original entrepreneur Dick Gibson, who was a bit of a, a crook from what it seems to be, and then uh, another millionaire, Barker Hickox, took over the scene and uh, paid off all the bills and did very well. It was the original promoter, um, um, Dick Gibson, who had given the name the world's greatest jazz band, and they didn't really like it that much because it was a bit pretentious, so they eventually loved to be better known as the uh, WGJB. They played at President Nixon's, well, yeah, well, you can make your mind up on here, inaugural ball in 1970 and made the first trip to England in December 1971. And I think this is the very recording. And it was on December the 15th when this concert was recorded. December the 15th, 10 days before Christmas, 1971. Publicity, however, not what it might have been. So, um... Yeah, they didn't have a good promoter, unfortunately, so I don't think there were that many people there, or not enough to make it pay. So there's another bouncing check that Mr Hickox was able to plaster on the ceiling of the, uh, his office, which we heard about last week, all the checks that had bounced, he stuck onto the wall. And it was the classic version of the band. It stayed together for longer than most, but then eventually the chairs held by the trombonist Lou McGarrity and Cutty Cutchell were taken over by Vic Dickinson and Ed Hubble and Gus Johnson, one of the best, but perhaps one of the least recognised of the drumming greats, came in to replace Murray Feld on the drums. And with the exception of Carl Fontana, who made a great contribution to the band's uh, early and late recordings, and the virtuoso Bob Wilbur, a stalwart for so many years, the, years the bands were selected from musicians of the swing era and then subsequent mainstream field as well, and a fine sound they made throughout their career and lasted for quite some time, as I say. And we saw them, I remember, back in, uh, where would it be? Torquay, I think it was, or somewhere like that. Not around anymore, by the way, if you're looking for them. All thing, good things come to an end, as they say, whether it's the world's greatest jazz band, or whether it's sweet and swing. But fear not, because we will be back next week. Same time, same place. See you then. Cheerio.